what he said he can do. He will be what he say he'll be. It's only just a test. He gonna bring you out. And if you think he can't bring you out, think about where he's already brought you from. Think the many times he's done things before you in the past that he'll do it right now. Oh God, our Father, we thank you right now. First thing I just want to speak into the spirit that it's, it's not as bad as it seems. Because who we belong to. Because we are your children. You allow things to happen in our lives, but because you're trying to bring us to a greater glory. And so we turn tears and we turn heavy hearts right now into praise and say, Lord, thank you because you are just shifting me from where I am to where you will have me to be. And so I thank you for economo right now. I thank you for the process of beginning to be closer to you. I thank you for the process of becoming all that you have purposed me to be. I thank you for the process of working your will in my life. We pray that because of what we're going through, it's not going to make us better, but it's just going to make us better. That we can testify more about you. We can say, I know he lives. We can say, I know what he brought me through. We can say, you don't have to tell me because I know too much about it. Be with them. Stand in them. Encourage them. Lift them right now in the name of Jesus we pray and we ask in Jesus name amen come on let's show them some love baby let's let's show them some love let's show them some love whether you know it or not it it takes it takes courage to, to come up and let and let people know that that we're going through something Satan get us out of shame more than anything because many times we are too private to go public to be able to get a blessing from God. Amen? Yeah, we're too private to go public uh, to, get a, to get a blessing from God. Amen. Praise his name. Uh, let's, let's, let's do this right quick. Uh, come on, we'll have a, a, let me let me tell you, I'm just, can y'all tell I'm just excited this morning? Huh? Yeah, I, I, I'm so excited this morning. I don't know, I don't know what to do. We were, we were, uh, we were laying in the hotel this morning about 4.30 and I told Joy, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. I wasn't even supposed to be here this morning. I told get up, get up, get up. We, 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 we got to go. We got to be at the church this morning. Just, just some. We got to be there this morning. We jumped up at five o'clock in the in the morning, hit the hit the freeway going eighty miles an hour, and within an hour's time, we was uh, Linda started talking. Who's that knocking on the window? Who's that knocking on the door? And we were here, baby. I'm just, I'm just excited. Uh, to be here this morning to see what God I didn't come here to feel good I felt good before I got here I just came to find God this morning I just came to find God amen come on let us hear from the choir this morning then we be right into our morning uh, morning message
this morning, look at the person uh, right next to you and say, I want to thank you for being Sunday's best guest this morning. Amen. Here number 403, what a friend we have in Jesus. Amen. Oh, what 
what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pains we bear. Oh, because we do not care. take it can we find a friend can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share Jesus knows knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Verse 3. Are we weak and heavy laid on? Come but with the load of care precious Savior still I rest what you gonna do take it to the Lord in prayer do thy friend despise Forsake thee, take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a soul. Thank your neighbor for being Sunday's best this morning. Amen. Come on, show them some love. God, our Father, Lord, we just thank you for another opportunity. We thank you for another chance to get it right. Lord, we just thank you right now for what you've done for us in our past, Lord, and what you're doing right now, Lord, and even how you're working out our future. Lord, I pray right now that you just remove Jeff, get Jeff completely out the way. And Lord, uh, allow me just to preach this as you preached it to me. So Lord, right now, I thank you for what you're going to do. I thank you for what you've already done. And Lord, especially, I thank you for what you're going to do. Lord, we don't need understanding. We don't even need to know how you're going to do it, Lord. And as we go through this text today, you reveal what needs to be revealed. And in the end, we'll be so careful to give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor. Let the church say amen. Amen. I hope y'all remember, uh, uh, I hope y'all remember the last time uh, when I was up before you and I told you that you had to leave Egypt behind. Yeah, amen. You had to leave Egypt behind. That message dealt with the transformation of the mindset. 
Yeah, a message on the transformation of the mindset. Today we're going to do uh, the part two of it. Uh, and it was just so funny. We went to a church to visit the other week, and as we was there, the preacher was preaching on the text that I had. And I'm like, okay, uh, uh, I was able to steal some nuggets off of that. Amen. Uh, this morning, I want you to turn to uh, the book of Exodus, 15th chapter, beginning at verse 22, and we're going to read down through verse 27. Yeah, Exodus 15, beginning at verse 22, and we're going to read down through verse 27. Our emphasis is going to be on the 27th verse. Uh, up on the screen, we have it in a uh, common text, a message, and I'll be reading it from that for the purpose of emphasis. Hey Amen. I still see some pages turning. I see some thumbs still scrolling. Uh, do we have it? Amen. And it reads like this, reading out of the Message Bible. Moses led Israel from the Red Sea onto the wilderness of Shur. They traveled for three days through the wilderness without finding any water. They got to Marah. But they couldn't drink the water at Marah because it was bitter. That's why they call the place Marah, meaning bitter. And the people complained to Moses. Yeah, amen. And the people complained to Moses. So what are we supposed to drink? So Moses cried out in prayer to God. God pointed him to a stick of wood. In the King James, the New King James uh, version, that says uh, a tree, all right? Uh, Moses threw it in the water, and the water turned sweet. The water was bitter. He threw a stick in the water, and the water became sweet. Y'all with me? And the, that's the place, that's the place where God set up rules and procedures. Oh, Lord, there go them, them pesky rules and procedures. That's where he started testing them. Did y'all hear that? Did you read that? Yeah. God said, if you listen, listen obediently to how God tells you to live in his presence, obeying his commandments, keeping all of his laws, then I won't strike you with diseases that I inflicted on the Egyptians. I am God, your healer. Yeah. And look at this, verse 27. They came to Elam, where there were 12 springs of water. They didn't have water. The water that was there was bitter. He threw a stick in it. The water got sweet. Now they come to a place to where they have an abundance of water. They have a, 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 a well for each tribe. Trees, enough for all the people. They came to Elam where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm, tree, palm trees. They set up camp there by the water. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and to the hearing of his word and especially in two hour doing of it. I want to talk this morning about, uh, you don't know the story. Yeah, you, you, you don't know the story. And the reason I say that you don't know the story because uh, uh, it's been told to you time and time again, but yet when there's a lack of rejoicing, when God does something great, you don't really know the story. You're not familiar with the God of the Israelites, the God that uh, made bitter water sweet. You don't know the story. And the thing about it is that we are now at a point to where we are going to our Elam. But there's a problem with us going to our Elam. Elam is this place of abundance. Elam meaning trees. So they had plenty of food, plenty of water, and there was a, a just, just plenty of stuff for the children of Israel. But the problem is that when we get to Elam is that people will see you there, but they know nothing about your Mara. People will see you in your Elam. They'll see you in your abundance, but they know nothing about your Mara. They know nothing about the bitter times. They know nothing about the problems. They don't know nothing about the trials. They don't know nothing about the tribulations. And when they look at you, they have a tendency of looking at you solely on where you are, not realizing where you come from. 
So in the process of them looking at you, we begin to take on a personification that this is what I'm all about. Well, that is not what made you. You are not made in abundance. You are made in the testing. Yeah, see, you don't know the story. Yeah, you, you, you don't know the story. Yeah, the songwriter says that you don't know the things that I've been through. Yet what I had to do to get here. The children of Israel are at Elam, but nobody looks at Mara. God just doesn't do things by happenstance. He works with precision. He brought them from Egypt, marched them to the Red Sea. Then the problems began to happen. They marched from Egypt with a song in their heart. They're happy. They're no longer enslaved. They're no longer in bondage. God has took them out of a place that they didn't want to be. Now they're on the move and God has done something great. Now they end up at the Red Sea and now things become problematic. But what does God do? If there was any doubt of how God, uh, good God was at that particular time, what God was capable of, God parted the sea and removed all doubt from anyone that had any inkling of doubt. Not only did he do that with the children of Israel, he's done that in our lives. We have a reference point to where we can go back and we can think about that particular place and point in time where God had to do something by a miraculous standard. To prove to us that he was God and he was God alone. Nothing that we were able to say was able to get us out. We weren't able to pray our way out. God had to intervene on our behalf, open up the Red Sea in order for us to come through. But yet, we come to a place of problem. Because we look at the situation and we look at where we are and we forget where we come from. And in the process of forgetting where we come from, we begin to display this personification. And people look at it and they're only concerned about our Elam and not our Mara. I told you, you didn't know the story. You know, I, I, I know you watched Charlton Heston and uh, uh, the Ten Commandments. Yeah, I, I know we're teaching uh, the Ten Commandments to the kids in the back, but you don't know the story. Yeah, what, what these folk had to go through. Yeah, Crystal is shaking her head, and it's, it's just funny to me because I, I, I remember part of her story. Yeah, yeah, I, I remember part of her story. Yeah, the part to where the doctor said that things were going to be problematic, and now Christina is running around here with no problems whatsoever. I remember part of the story, and what it is, you can see her relishing in the glory now because of what happened then. Not because of what the doctor was able to do, not because of what the doctor said, all because of what God had to show her. He had to do it by a miraculous standard in order to remove any doubt whatsoever. They at the Red Sea. God removes the doubt. But the thing about the children of Israel is this they are careless in their reverence. They're capricious in their attitude and they're callous in their belief. Here is a God that we say we know and yet and still when trials and tribulations and circumstances come about us, we don't act as if we know him. Amen. Have you noticed that when God begins to work on you and you get into some problems that your prayer changes? Yeah, you get out of being thankful for what God has done and you begin to almost beg God to do something full of doubt in your heart, old strong Christian, old man of God, old woman of God. And, and I know you, 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 you're probably thinking that, well, I ain't never doubted. Is that right? They come to Camp Mara. The problem with Mara is this, that the water is considered brackish. Brackish is when fresh water uh, uh, meets with salt water. At that particular point, it, 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 it's, the water is trying to mix together. The, 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 the salt is trying to take over the fresh. The fresh is trying to take over the salt. And what it is is that it doesn't make for good consumption for anybody. They're at Mara. They taste the water. But what I find interesting about this, when they got there, they seen that the water was bitter. They named the place prior to God ever doing anything. 
God had already done something with them with water. He brings them to water and they forget what he had already done with water. You go through something once in your life, it should not bend you out of shape when you hit it a second time. You ought to be able to think back on what God has already done. And because he already done it, you know what he can do. You don't get to the place of the same thing and go through the same problems again. Yeah, why did, why, why, why did these folk forget? They named the place Mara. God didn't even have a chance to do what he could do. Yeah. And what it is is that they named it bitterness. They focused on the negative of their situation instead of the positive ability of God. You missed that. They focused on the negative of the situation instead of the positive ability of God. In other words, is this. It was so difficult and it was so bad and I guess the water was, was, was mm. you know what, let me get off water. We've been through some things in this church and I say we because I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to call any, you know, if you raise your hand then I can use your story. Uh, let me use mine. Uh, uh, God has been working and God has been working for a while. But in the process of him working, there have been some times where I've been placed in some situations where I just wanted to give up. I didn't want to preach. I didn't want to teach. I didn't even want to come to church. And nine times out of ten, and I tell you, and I'll be very honest, uh, I'm generally, well, we, we have not been the, 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 the type of people that go out of town and miss church. When you see me, when you don't see me on a Tuesday, that means that I'm having a problem. And I'm not having a problem with individuals. I'm having a problem with myself because I'm tired, I'm fed up, I'm frustrated, and I just don't want to do this no more. Yeah, it might be few and far between, but it does happen. I don't want to preach. I don't want to read the Bible. I don't even want nobody to, 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 to uh, what the Lord said, hey, keep it. Keep it. I reminded of my friend when, when I was living in Michigan and he had given his life to Christ and, you know, he knew the way that I was raised and, you know, he used to, we used to keep in touch, you know, we, we were boys, we were buddies, we've been hanging since the sixth grade and he calls me and he, and, and he hey, hey man, I, I hear what you're saying, he's trying to get me in the door but I don't want to hear nothing about the door, I don't even know what the door is and I'm telling him, I'm saying, hey man, hold up on all of that, yeah, I, I, I know, I just ain't ready. We got to realize that we get to points and places in our life where the burdens begin to take over us, the trials, the tribulation, we get frustrated. And the main reason that we get frustrated is because we're trying to do things the way we think it should be done instead of the way God says it should happen. See how changeable our condition and how quick we are to judgment. What's funny about it is that when our provision ceases, our faith comes to an end. Yeah, write that one down. Put that one in your, in your phone. When our provision ceases, that's when our faith ends. When God closes the window of heaven, yeah, faith is gone. When God takes that hand of favor off your life, we lose faith. Just like the children of Israel. Y'all with me? I'm almost done. The people knew where they were going. We get happy when we hear we're going to the land of milk and honey. All we could think about, Brother Greg, is the milk and the honey. I don't know what kind of excitement they had uh, behind a land of milk and honey because I just can't put milk and honey together. Yeah, you know, so I'm, I'm I, you know, that, you know, Lord moved me to the land of beans and rice. Yeah, and it can't be regular white rice. It has to be, you know, you know, a dirty rice. It got to be brown rice. I'm not a white rice eater. Yeah, you know, I, I, I can get excited behind that. Yeah, because that's something that I know about. They were going to the land of milk and honey. But in the process of them going to the land of milk and honey, their pleasures on the way to Canaan 
can't be stopped. What happens on the way to the land of milk and honey or beans and rice or whatever your thing is, yeah, steak and eggs, yeah, peanut butter and jelly, you know, whatever your thing is, yeah, yeah, whatever happens in the route and when you know where you're going, whatever happens along the way shouldn't throw you off course to where you forget about where you're going. Many times we find ourselves not going where we're supposed to go because we get off course in the process of going where we know we're going. If God says that he is going to bless you, your focus should be on what he's going to do. Uh, Pastor said it best a while back. He said it, it, it's not in the promise, but it, it's, it's in his word. When he says it, it has to come into fruition. But it seems like we lose sight of what has to come about because he said it. When he says it, it has to happen. So everything else that happens in the process and on the way there really should not matter at all because our focus should be on what he Check this out. Before they got to Camp Elam, when they get to Mara, look at what happened. God knew the water was brackish. He knew that the water wasn't fit for consumption. But isn't it amazing? Watch this. Watch this. Before they ever got to Mara, the provision was already there and in place. The tree at Mara was there before they left Egypt. See, you don't know the story. You don't, you don't know the story. You don't know the story. I'm trying to drive this point home because it don't seem like it's sinking. While they were in bondage, going through what they were going through, up under the taskmaster's hand, being slaves, God had already made a provision prior to them ever leaving the land. They traveled across the desert but the provision was already there. They get to the Red Sea, could not cross it. The provision was already there. It is not about where they was at. They walk through the sea, get to Mara. They begin to complain, not knowing that the provision was already provided. How often do we get upset with what God is doing and the way we think? We never look at the fact that when we get to where we're going and we're getting ready to run into a fork in the road, the provision yeah. is already there. The way God was going to get you out was already there before you got in. So when you get to the point of being able to get out of You ask, how is he going to work it out? Don't matter. It's already worked out. How is he going to do it? I can't see how he's going to do it. It's already done. What's going to happen when I get, these are the questions that you ask. What's going to happen when I get there? It don't matter. Because what you need is going to be there prior to you even getting there. And it's not only in the circumstance and the situation that you're in right now. It is for each and every one that you come about in life. This was the beginning of the testing. He provided for them. He done it with precision. He gave them provision. And now they're at Camp Elam. They are in a place of abundance. What you got to understand about the word camp is this. 
When we look at camp, normally we think about uh, packing up and going out into the wilderness. No, 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 no. The Hebrew word says camp means this. It means that the nation is placed over another nation. Y'all didn't get that? In order for a nation to be placed over another nation, what comprises a nation is not a nation. What comprises a nation is individuals. In order for a nation to do what it has to do, God has to do something with the individual. And when God does something with the individual and we come together on a collective, there is nothing that can stand in front of the nation because the nation is a group of individuals that are on one accord doing what God says the way that he says it. And what he mm, and what he does, he does not put you on the bottom. When God makes you pitch a tent, he pitches the tent on top. You're missing it. You're missing it. You're missing it. Camp